Hello, yo. Yes, this is a PS. This is a PS. I heard you very well. Just imagine two guys going seven miles down into the deepest end of the deepest ocean. This is winding. We have bioluminescence at 32. Here we have again, over. Just boggles your mind to think of something going down there. Dive to the deepest known place on Earth. Challenge a deep in the Pacific's Mariana Trench, more than 11 kilometers beneath the sea. No air, no light. Two men would set out to explore the ocean's most hostile extremity. 28-year-old U.S. Naval Lieutenant Don Walsh, a qualified submarine officer, and 37-year-old Swiss engineer Jacques Picard. Together they would pilot a one-of-a-kind bathyscaphe. The Trieste, a creation of Jacques' father and collaborator, physicist Auguste Picard, best known for his high-altitude study of cosmic rays. Through the 1920s and 30s, his pressurized spherical capsule would set records. Auguste Picard was unbelievable. He never took a rest. Even on the coffee break, he was thinking about something. Always working. Between 1930 and 1932, his balloon flights produced the first accurate measurements of radiation from space. Picard traveled to the 1933 World Exposition in Chicago, where his stratospheric gondola was on display next to the deep diving bathysphere designed by Otis Barden and William Beebe. The experience was life-changing. Picard would now direct his attention to deep sea exploration and research. Delayed by the outbreak of World War II, it was not until 1948 that the craft would finally venture into the ocean. On its first unmanned deep dive, Picard's FNRS-2 would reach the astonishing depth of 1,400 meters. Picard knew that it could withstand pressure at depths far, far greater. His third and most ambitious attempt, a new bathyscaphe, the Trieste. The principle behind the, the design of the Trieste is it's a balloon. It's a balloon that goes down instead of up. Hanging below this gasoline-filled bag, if you will, the steel ball where these two guys were crouched together looking out this tiny, tiny little porthole. When you think about the basic physics, you know, gasoline floats, you just need enough to float that 11-ton sphere. Uh, you got the chambers on the end for air that hold you up in the surface like a life jacket. Amazing stuff that they really pulled off. The U.S. Navy Office of Naval Research had heard of Picard's work in Italy, by now in collaboration with his son Jacques. Uh, undersea warfare is the Navy's game, and that's a part of it that I was involved in. And you need information. I think it was in 1956 or so, I got a directive to visit Naples, Italy, and inspect the Bathyscaf Trieste. There were a lot of things we didn't know about the atmospheric environment. Trieste offered a possibility of getting information that otherwise we couldn't get. The Navy, they were operating in a world that no one really understood, and they needed to study this and understand it. So they went to Europe, and they found the Trieste. It was a very interesting visit. The team was comprised of Jacques Picard, an Italian mechanic, Giuseppe Buono. I grew up in the shipyard in Italy, and Project Trieste came along, and that was right in. And a 12-year-old boy named Johnny. That was the entire team. So came back and reported on that and said, yeah, it looks like it's worth looking into. In 1958, the Navy purchased the Trieste, replacement parts, and the consulting services of the Picards and Giuseppe Buono, moving them all to the Naval Electronics Laboratory in San Diego. A gutsy deep-sea research mission had begun, Project Necton. Qualified naval submarine officer Lieutenant Larry Schumacher was appointed executive officer and 34-year-old Dr. Andy Rechtitzer was appointed scientist in charge and project director. Andy was a pioneer in his own right who helped convince the Navy to do what they did. 
just one of those people who truly made a difference. I was a lieutenant in the Navy, 28 years old, and four years out of the Naval Academy. So one day, I'm sitting in my office on board the submarine tender, then comes this fellow, introduce himself. My name's Andy Recknitzer. And he said, the Navy's just bought this new thing, Bathyscaphe Trieste. And he had this big, very tall guy with him. He didn't say much. His name was Jacques Picard. The Commodore said, well, how can we help? Andy Recknitzer was loaded for that question. He said, glad you asked. The only job description in the Navy we can find that is for a submersible pilot would be a submarine officer, one volunteer. When I became the officer in charge of the U.S. Navy Bathyscaphe Trieste, my first command in the Navy. Recknitzer and Schumacher quickly assembled a small team of naval and civilian specialists, no more than 17 men in all, with a taste for the unknown. In 1959, they put a flyer out to the fleet and asked for a submarine engine, and he found out they don't make things, submarine engines, so they put out a notice that we wanted machine repairmen. And I was a brand new machine repairman chief at that time. The goal of Project Necton was basically to prove out this new platform, to show that it was capable of going anywhere in the world ocean. How do you do that? You go to the very deepest place in the ocean. Oh, I would like to go all the way someday. How, how far is all the way? 35,150 feet. And the Baptist Gap, take somebody down that far, Jacques. First up, can go any In 1959, after just a handful of dives off the coast of California, Recknitzer felt the Trieste was ready for deeper water. They found what they were looking for in the Western Pacific. Necton's mission, a dive to the deepest place on Earth, Challenger Deep. 350 kilometers southwest of Guam, 10,960 meters below the ocean's surface. Here, Mount Everest would stand 2,066 meters underwater. The Marianas Trench it's as far away as you can get on the planet from the surface of the planet. Performance of every system on the Trieste was rigorously evaluated and adjusted. Trieste, as purchased and delivered in San Diego, was a 20,000-foot submersible. At the original cabin, which was made in Italy, and the original floater balloon was only capable of that depth. The real star was John Michel. He was the kind of guy that, if you had a requirement for somebody, just tell him what you needed, give him the materials, you know, sort of shove them under the door, and out would come the perfect piece. We needed so many, many things done on the scaff. As I started replacing things, we broke the antechamber window, the sphere came apart, the water current meter, that wasn't working anymore. He took the Trieste in and put it up on land and took it all apart, and then put the new cabin on it and had the extended balloon. Everything on the bathyscaphe is one of a kind. Nothing you can buy off the shelf. Everything that we put on the bathyscaphe, we had to think of and design and make it. Test dives off Guam began. Nothing could be left to chance. They did this step by step by step. Each time they did it, there was this kind of challenge and response and challenge. And so they worked deeper, they got deeper. November 59, we made a dive to 18,000 some odd feet. So that set a new world's record. And then in January, we dove to 24,000 feet, another record. The team faced daunting setbacks, but each was met with a solution. Confident, the fragile Trieste was slowly towed towards her destiny. If you're interested in where the deepest spot is, you've got all kinds of maps. But that's a very long time ago and probably not too accurate. So what we did was we used explosives and we'll time the echo. We surveyed an awful lot of water out there trying to find that deepest spot. And on the day before the deep dive, we had it pretty well nailed down where we wanted to be. After months of work, the day had come. January 23rd, 1960. With Lieutenant Don Walsh and Jacques Picard selected to make the attempt. On the morning of the deep dive, we had now determined where Challenger Deep was, sort of this axis of seven miles long and about a mile wide. And when the tug came out from Guam, towing the Trieste at a magnificent five knots, which is as fast as we dare go. Because uh, remember, it's an underwater balloon, it's pretty fragile. And came out, we said, okay, put it here. That's where we did the dive. 
There was a lot to think about that morning. The sea state was somewhat rough. Well, that day was pretty bad. <laughs> we ended up on the rough sea, and the Trieste was pretty bad. The inside was more safe than the inside because of the waves. It was a lot of shock there. They got to decide we can do all we can do. The moment comes, if you miss it, it may never happen. You can do all the preliminary work and all the rehearsals, but when you make that final push to the very bottom of the ocean, boy, this is for keeps. And that was a big to-do. We had the meeting at our long green table. We had two lieutenants, myself, 